Hi, everyone. Oh, this mic is loud. <laughs> um, so my name is Gina Harasti, and uh, thank you very much for uh, coming today. And uh, um, I'm really honored to be here with people following uh, people like Usman. So thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is is a bit following what Usman was saying about uh, giving ownership and uh, to people and letting them participate. Um, so, but what I'm going to talk about is more in a pop cultural context. So, I have worked um, at the beginning of my career as an experimental artist and, and video artist. So, um, I come, I went through different, uh, went through working with different media throughout my life, and I moved to Canada around six years ago to uh, study film production. And I went to like this big, uh, you know, traditional film school in North America with big industry and studios and all that stuff. And and I was very excited. And one of the first things they thought they uh, they taught me was that a story is told with a beginning, a middle, and an end. <laughs> that is like baseline in film school. And I thought, yeah, okay, that you know, probably most people think that that's the definition of how a story is told, but. It always bothered me, and being a rebel, I always wanted to, to do something with that or, or you know, think of better ways how, how that can be you know, reinvented. So right away in, uh, in my first year, I uh, pitched my first uh, film, and uh, really everybody really hated it. <laughs> my, people, my, my teacher actually got quite mad uh, because I was pitching my way, I think, in a way that didn't like it, and I didn't know what was wrong with my film. Um, well, I didn't tell them a story. I, coming from a different media, I started to tell them, you know, about lighting and, and how I'm going to convey my message through the medium and, and the, how there's going to be these weird effects and all that stuff. But I didn't tell them a story. So, um, I, and I was really worried that maybe my film is really bad and uh, something happened to the image. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, and so, but then, Thank God my, my film was nominated for Best Canadian Short, so I think my film was not bad. <laughs> it's just there was a misunderstanding because in the film industry, um, even now, pitching a story is, is one of the most paramount things. So this is the, the film of what, this is the trailer of the film, so you, you understand a bit more what I'm talking about. Coming from, from an experimental background, I really tried to work with, instead of beginning, middle, and end, I worked with left, middle, and, and right, and, and uh, backstage, and midstage, and front, and dark, and light, and loud, and quiet. And you don't hear it now, but for example, actors speak, but you don't hear what they say, and all these different things. I tried to convey my message through these tools and not with the story itself. It's a murder story, by the way, if you need to know that. <laughs> Uh, it has nothing to do with murder, so, but that's the story. So, um, basically, I got interested in, in how me coming from a different medium kind of gave me a different, you know, maybe an advantage or understanding how my, my new medium works and understanding how its strategies and methods and tools can be, can be viewed from a different point of view. And after film school, I, I found myself working with video games. And I always liked video games. Um, I'm a total geek, and I, but I didn't have a computer until I was 20. So what I did is that I had this subscription to, to, to game magazines, and I read the walkthroughs, which are basically, they just tell you a story how what happens in the game as you go through the game. They were kind of like these uh, scripts I read for films that I've never seen. and. Um, and so basically, 10 years later now, I'm running um, a game research center in, in Canada. Uh, this is one of our programs. And what people do there, including me, I guess, is that we, we talk, we design, we talk about games, we design games, we, we experiment with them uh, on a PhD level in order to, to, to understand game and to, to treat games and, and make everyone aware that games can be just a medium just like film or music or dance and you can really use that to to convey you know artistic or social messages or or maybe even change change the world with them um, and I don't exaggerate I really mean it <laughs> so um, so basically uh, I 
I found myself in this space and I started to think about narrative. And um, in games, there are a lot of different interesting ways how, how stories are told. Uh, maybe one of the most uh, common and most well-known is, is things like uh, the game Assassin's Creed, which uh, probably a lot of you know. Um, and it's, it's pretty much a very filmic cinematic narrative. It's very linear. Uh, there are um, main events that follow each other. They're pre-scripted. You have to go through them, although you have the impression you have freedom in exploration. And you can wa walk around in a large world. You can do a lot of things, but really, we are following these main events that we really lead to this one ending that was prescripted, and you must arrive there. Um, so that is something more traditional. But then there are games uh, that have more of a branching narrative that we often refer to. Um, oh yeah, trigger warning. Uh, there's going to be some zombies in here, and some zombie actions happening. So watch out. Um, so games like Walking Dead has this branching narrative, and in, and uh, this game uses. If uh, for Hungarians, maybe the Kolandiatik, Kotskazot, Könyvek, uh, those kind of books are familiar, uh, or in English is the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Pretty much there, you f have a bit of more freedom. You can explore many different stories, and you can actually have different endings, like mostly dying or not dying. <laughs> um, but this is what we usually call interactive. So when you go and like explore interactive movies online or interactive documentaries, this is what usually happens. Um, and so this, this is already something, um, you know, it's good to look at, good to think about. But then there's a third way, uh, which I find the most fascinating. And um, these games like, like Minecraft, which is basically an online Lego type big game, um, they have something what's called an emergent narrative. That means that the, the emergent narrative refers uh, to this ongoing and in-process communication between the player or the person and the system, the person and the, and the platform, player and player, and author and um, audience. So from this, these, these discussions and interactions, the narrative emerges. Um, and usually these narratives are often one of, you know, some of the best game narratives, game stories out there and they are always unscripted and unplanned for by the authors or the game designers who, who made the game originally. Um, for example, when I, I started playing Minecraft a year and a half ago, which is pretty late, I guess, um, and, uh, and one of my first experiences was I had no idea what's going on. I run around like how you see it in the back. Oh, you click on these things, you remove them, and you can place them again, and what is happening? And then suddenly it was night, and then there were monsters. It was really scary. And, um, but the day came again, and I was very happy. I had some friends online uh, chatting with me, helping me how to, what to do. And I found these chickens, and I was like really happy. And I wanted them to love me, and I wanted to befriend them. But it didn't really work. I, I was I trying to pet them, but I hid them instead. And, and they, it made them angry. It made them kind of red, like you see that. And so my friends in the chat, they were like, oh, go get seeds, and then you feed them the seeds, and they will love you again. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. I took 20 minutes, but I got seeds. I went back, and I'm holding the seeds in my fist, and I'm giving it to the chickens. <laughs> of course, they're not loving me, because they're killing them in the seeds, in my fist, filled with seeds. <laughs> um, and then, basically, I figured it out, and now I'm like a pretty, pretty obsessed Minecraft player. I'm actually working on a documentary on it, so... <laughs> um, uh, and what I did is that it was such an overwhelming story that I decided to write it down and send it to my friends, be like, oh, this is so funny. And it went kind of viral. People got really into, into this little story, and it got me thinking, like, how, you know, these, these stories that emerge from these narrative-less games are somehow very rich and very personal, and they're extremely diverse. And so there are games like... Um, another game like Sims, which is a which is a dollhouse like a game where you basically it's kind of like playing around with dolls, or it's also called often as a goth simulator. It's also a game where there is no goal, so you really just do whatever you want. And uh, and so there's so many uh, documentation and and the dissemination of these these emerging narratives that players publish and they make you know videos in YouTube or Vimeo and. They're called Let's Plays or Machinimas 
or, or walkthroughs. And they have, of course, different goals and, and different, uh, they are different tools to disseminate uh, parts of the game. But what I find the most, most interesting is these personal stories. Uh, this one is, for example, one of the most famous Sims player and YouTuber. Uh, she comes up with these goals she's going to do in-game. This one is one of her most popular um, stories. It's uh, her, her main character in the game um, is this one of, the, one of the girls. And she decided that the girl is going to get pregnant with all the guys in town. <laughs> so she started documenting it. And it's like this 90-hour-long series on YouTube by the time you know, she gets to gets with all the guys, <laughs> and, and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people watch this on, you know, online, and not just this one, there are so many of these, and, and, um, and it's kind of like this reality TV, I guess, because they're just so, so personal, it's like watching a film every time you watch it, although you play the game, but you play differently. So, um, basically, what I found is that to be able to, oh, hold on. Um, so yeah, so these emergent narratives, uh, if you want to create things like that, you really need that world under it. So if you want to make these worlds, you cannot just be, you know, you cannot master one, one medium. You really have to be suf like, sufficient in a, in a lot of different media, or at least it's very, it's very advantageous. So you kind of, to order, in order to build these, worlds, you have to know a lot of different things and a lot of different media. And, and, it, and you kind of need to be able to make maybe even games or films or, or, and hopefully your stuff is going to end up on YouTube and people are going to even make fan creations after that. So, so some of the worlds that I'm talking about, you know them really well. For example, uh, there is um, Astro Boy by Osamu Tezuka or Wachowski's Siblings Matrix, uh, where, where they're not just a film, not just a game, but there's this whole universe out there. And, and you, know, uh, you know a lot about it through watching the movies and playing the games and collecting the cards and the stickers and et cetera. And uh, this is what often referred to as a transmedial universe. And this kind of transmediality is that what led media critics like uh, Azuma Hiroki to argue that in postmodernity, um, people want to consume these worlds, not the stories. So, in these world-centric universes uh, that we often, you know, just look at from the outside and think of stories. Um, for example, Pokemon is another good example, which I think most people will know. Um, a wide variety, wide variety of different transmedia stories come together in order to, to allow you to look at this universe from different angles and look at this world through a story or a movie uh, at a different part of this world and get to know that world more and more. So in, in Azuma's uh, context, he calls this world the database. And he says that, so when we, when we are looking at a story or a film, we're really just consuming the, the surface layer of this. And there used to be a grand narrative behind it, which is the, the gray blob, blob uh, on the left. Um, and we just used to access that through the surface layer. But what happens now is that we are assessing this database, what the world is. And people, people are much more interested in that. And, well, why is that? So, um, oh yeah, and the surface layer can be really anything, um, you know, from film to collecting stickers or whatever it is. So, what's really fascinating for me in this is that um, this using, working with the database gives a lot of agency to the audience because th they, they are able to, to um, to, to, to be authors of their own narratives, what they consume. So they can create their own data assemblies and those data assemblies became, become these, the stories. So, and not just the, the, they don't just become the author, but they can also become the main character in it. And uh, they can make their own stories, their, uh, you know, where they're their main characters. And, and this is what often referred to as the fan fiction or fan creation, which is 
a huge, huge industry out there. And actually in Japan, it is such a big deal that, that the, the legal system had to change in order to allow these fans and you know, regular people like us to, 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 to be able to make, uh, to contribute to the world of Harry Potter or the world of Pokemon. And, and not, you know, the companies wouldn't sue them for, for copyright infringement, but instead they were like, oh, this is so good, we're gonna incorporate this into the world of Pokemon or into the Super Mario world. And so that is a huge power um, that you, the big companies acknowledge in Japan. And the footage you're seeing up there is, um, is from my latest documentary, it is about geek culture, uh, actually women in geek culture, and um, the huge crowd you see uh, later and before uh, is, bas is was shot at this convention in Japan. It's called Comicat. That is the second biggest gathering of humankind in the world after the religious pilgrimage of Mecca. And it's nothing but fan creation market. It's not even the big companies selling their stuff. No, it's really, it's just people taking the, the data from the database, reassembling it into their stories and, and selling it to each other. That's the second biggest gathering of humankind. Just want to say it again. <laughs> so um, I want to finish on this, uh, this video. Um, so this is something I'm working on now and, and I use the, a lot of um, different methods that are very inherent in transmedial projects um, it's, it's not just going to be a film. Uh, I'm trying to create this whole world out there. Uh, actually, I'm documenting this world that is already there and, uh, and finding different media outputs, data assemblies to, to create, and the film is one of them. And um, what's really important, on top of that, I, I also I decided to entrust a community that is both the future audience of my film and the subject of it. And so I created a lot of different, this, this was at the market, the comic at market, it's kind of scary. Um, and I created a lot of different platforms where I'm able to communicate with the people. I w you know, I'm on Twitter and Tumblr with the project and a lot of other platforms. And at first I didn't even think, I just, um, I just posted things and, and I wanted to have a conversation. But what was really amazing is that people didn't just like comment or post things, they also started to um, you know, really take uh, take ownership of the project, and and they became, in a sense, co-author of the film. People nominated uh, others to be to be interviewed for the film. Uh, someone sent me a message on Twitter, and it turned out to be an amazing recommendation. And that person is now in the movie. Um, so really, that person I cannot deny is, is in a sense, is the co-author of this whole thing. Other people decide. Uh, this is a Tumblr, and I put up shots sometimes and, and images of the film and people go like, oh, I love this and this should really be in the movie. And I thought, really? Okay. <laughs> I, didn't, I wouldn't have thought, I wouldn't have put that in there. The, the first image is actually one of those images. It was in the bin and I decided, okay, if everybody loves it, I'm definitely putting it in there. Um, but it goes beyond that. And I think it's really fascinating to think about how you can engage engage the audience and, and you know, communicate with them. And it gives them a lot of um, agency and, and how, and of course they're gonna be hopefully much more interested in what, when the, the product is done because they were part of it. So, so really this film, Otaku no Otaku, is just, it just represents one of possible ways to, to learn from lessons of other media um, and how to apply those to, to the media you work in um, in order to, you know, reinvent it and, and find new ways to work with. And, and also, there, there are really many reasons uh, why it's beneficial to, to open your horizon and look at other, other media's tools and strategies and methods because um, those inherent, um, you know, specificities, these other media um, are, are, are doing to... to to build community and, and deepen audience engagement, and of course, build, make stories, tell stories in new and innovative ways, is I think many of us are looking for, and hopefully we all, all need that. So um, I only explored, explored this one narrow band of, of, uh, of telling stories and new possibilities, but there are so many out there, and, 
And so keep your eyes open because you never know what, where your inspiration is. Uh, maybe you're gonna, uh, you know, the need to befriend an in-game chicken will lead you to discover this whole new world out there. So yeah, thank you very much.